Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. What is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching Untold Stories, where together, all of us together, twice a week from all over the world, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders to truly, truly understand how this movement came to be, where we are right now, and where we're going. And what we do is we spend a lot of time trying to figure out where our industry is going to be a year from now, two years from now. We're not looking at the, the layers and the fluff and what people are building on top of what we have now. We're talking to the people that are building for the demand of the future. Uh, we've had some amazing guests last week, and I'm really excited to talk to Matt Gould from Unstoppable Domains. You've heard of the project before. It allows you to uh, purchase, but not just that. It allows you to finally transfer your identity away from like uh, an address, an Ethereum address or a different blockchain address into like a potential uh, uh, name that you can use for all across multiple blockchains. And really, I'm trying to understand how we're all, we'll all use these identities in the future when it comes to NFTs and not just the way they look or potential the way they sound, but it's also about kind of this like battery for our identity and then transferring that and value. And it's like, we're all trying to figure it out. Thank you so much for coming on Untold Stories today. Uh, happy to be here. And it is exciting. We've come a long way over the last decade in the space. Uh, and it's really fun to see all these developments. People actually uh, really starting to get this in, in their everyday lives. What gave you the idea? Because I don't know if you remember, uh, Namecoin was one of the I first, uh, yeah, it was one of the first like Bitcoin forks. And the idea, I think even there were conversations with that Satoshi had had before he disappeared about doing, you know, a new DNS, but having a new type of system away from like the ICANN and the TLDs of today and transferring our identity uh, onto the blockchain. This, this idea like like domains, but you guys have taken it a step further by allowing people actual ownership of that and being able to use it to transfer not just for for domains, but also for payments. Do you uh, did did the technology need to exist now for you to be able to do that, like the ERC seven twenty one standard? Yeah, well, I can take a step back and tell you how I got into it. it is when I first approached blockchains back in uh, in crypto, and it was all Bitcoin back in twenty thirteen. I was actually very interested in the uh, non financial use cases for um, blockchain and, and Bitcoin technology, and the first place that I started working on was actually reputation. So I actually ended up in names because I first started working on uh, like, how can you uh, do like verified reviews? So I did like a version of Yelp, but using Bitcoin <laughs> so that yeah. people could, so you could see ratings. And and what I realized is, and then also doing things like verified news. And what I realized is if you try to use these public blockchains for, you know, verifying data um, and, and acting as kind of like a, like a credit check or something, because you could be sure that this information is accurate. Uh, and try to build reputation systems, you really need to have names. And I had always been aware of the Namecoin project like you had talked about. But I guess uh, what happened is at some point during that journey, I realized uh, having these digital naming re registries like Namecoin or you know, like Unstoppable Domains and our uh, NFT domain name extensions, they're a really great way for people to start to build their digital identities because uh, you have this immutable blockchain record that people can be very confident about. Uh, just like when you're confident that you own your Bitcoin because it's in your wallet, you could be confident about owning your digital ID because you know that NFT domain is in your wallet and you can start putting more things um, into that. So that's actually how I got to it, uh, was coming from the reputation side of things and uh, the non-financial use cases for Bitcoin. And, and that's eventually became the NFT movement. There are like a bunch of people in the blockchain space who are interested about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain, but not necessarily finance stuff. Um, and you really saw that explode over the last uh, three or four years. But we've been here for a very long time. It's just took a while for the tech to get here. And so you kind of mentioned, like, did we need to have the ERC-721 uh, to make that happen? I think the answer is yes. Uh, until you had smart contract blockchains with Nakamoto, uh, <laughs> with, with Nakamoto consensus, um, it was difficult to build some of these more, uh, more interactive um, applications for Bitcoin. Sure. So, yeah. And, you know, I think we... And, and I struggle with this too, and kind of how I formulate my questions. We, we think of domains, and, and I don't even know if that's like the, the term that you use, in a very like Web2-centric way. Websites, browser, you know, 
set maybe like a, it could be used as a Venmo type of address that on top of a blockchain pe- people could send you transactions. But I'm trying to like think of it in a way. It's like we have city coins. Miami just got five million dollars this week from the city coin project. Right. New York, Austin. You know, people were laughing at city coins. Now they're doing them. Really, is the next step in what we think of Web three? Is it is it trivial for like a local government to allow you to like attach your driver's license to your unstoppable domain NFT? And then what type of implications could that bring you? Because now you can attach a digital identity to like civic things, things that you need to do with your city, whether it's voting or paying utilities and things like that. Yeah, I think uh, it is it is uh, easily doable. And we're actually working on uh, something to allow you to attach that type of information right now. We're not working with the city or government, uh, but you, so you will be able to attach your, uh, like your driver's license information um, about yourself to a, a NFT domain that you own. And then you're right. You will, you will be able to participate um, in online associations and they, and they know that you're the real person and that's going to be just a huge step up for allowing more people to participate. And you hit on something good there, which is like, uh, we call them domains. And internally, <laughs> we say that, you know, domains is, it's kind of the same way that you called phones in the 1980s. And like, when you said a phone in 1980, it's like a rotary phone. Uh, and then today, when you say phone, it's, just, you know, the uh, computer in your pocket. And in the 1980s, you used a phone for phone calls. And then today, you use a phone for basically everything except phone calls, text messaging and everything like that. Yeah. I think it's going to be the same thing with domains, where domains, people think right now, Web 2, they think websites. But when you think domains, Web 3, you're actually going to be thinking like digital identity, sending and receiving payments, uh, verifying information about yourself, using it to log into things in SSO. Uh, and I think it's I think it's going to be give people a lot more power online and a lot more voice. It, it will give them voice is the key. Voice is the key. And there's a lot of implications about like being able to have uh, your voice in a decentralized way and an identity, but being able to choose uh, what to say, when to say it, how to say it, w- where to say it, and who can control what you say, having it immutable and censorship resistant. But you just reminded me of a funny story. So um, languages and linguistics, right? About the word like phone. The... All languages have built into them, especially if they've survived hundreds, if not thousands of years, ways to create new words within them that follow the same like mechanics that maintain the integrity of the language. But like we invent new things, so we need to create new words all the time. We add words to the dictionary, but there's kind of like a flow to them. And a lot of times our words end up just coming from other languages. But the word phone is how you say that in every language like that. There was no way for languages to create the word like a different word for phone just because that was such a novel thing no one had ever thought of putting this like a rock against your ear because that's what these phones are made out of they're made out of like basically sand and silicon and you have it against your phone and you're in your ear and you can hear someone who has another rock against their phone somewhere else in the world it's a it's a crazy thing in fact in like hebrew the word phone is literally translated to like like miracle like just Pele, like miracle, because they couldn't uh-huh. even conceptualize. It's like it must have been from God. And <laughs> same thing with like actually the word like banana. It's like banana. It's just in every language too. But it's like what the hell is this thing? But it just. But maybe terms are going to change. But like you said, we we can't even fathom the phone type of invention of the future because our brains just don't have the capacity. We haven't been able to put all those kind of connections together to create that. I don't even think we could have conceptualized how to solve the Byzantine general's problem until Satoshi solved it in 2009. I, I think the same thing is going to happen with domains and, and, and digital identity. And the number one thing that I get from people when I tell them that we do NFT domains for Web3 identity uh, is they get the domains part and they get the website part. But, they, but understanding the identity piece, I'll be perfectly honest, I, I even struggle communicating to my team how much impact I think this is going to have because it's very difficult. Uh, to kind of imagine like what happens when all, you know, everyone on the planet with a cell phone, literally billions of people has an easier way to uh, move around with a digital identity. And there's something like a billion plus people connected uh, online who don't even have an identity. Um, and those people are going to be able to get online and start participating in things. Um, and it's also going to be a lot easier to participate across borders. And it's from very silly things or very trivial. Like you might think it's trivial, for instance, like 
uh, let's say you just have a Reddit forum for your local community or for maybe the city of Miami or something. Uh, if people have uh, digital identities online, you can actually verify that that person lives there, right? And and nothing yeah. frustrates me frustrates me more in online communities when I'm trying to have co- uh, conversations with other people, and those people don't even have a horse in the race; they're just, they're just there to troll or to, you know to make these other types of problems happen. Um, and you you just can't build tight knit communities online. Everyone knows you don't get the same connection digitally that you can get in person, and a lot of that is because uh, you you just you can't bring your full self into the digital world yet. And you see this huge movement um, in the tech community. Everyone sees Facebook pushing really hard into the metaverse, right? And I think that the uh, broader tech community has identified that people are going to spend a lot more time in digital spaces. They're going to need digital money. They're going to need digital assets. Um, and we have to bring we have to bring more tools to that to make those spaces uh, more entertaining and more interactive. Uh, for users. And I think the digital identity is is a part of that. So, uh, and it'll also cross over into the real world. It doesn't have to just all be in uh, in the virtual world. Like you can use your uh, digital identity when you check in, you know, at the football game or, yeah. you know, pick up some tickets for a concert or something like that. But I, I'm, it's hard to imagine kind of all the places it's going to interact. Uh, but I think it's, you know, the opportunity seems huge. Were you someone who spent there like as a you know, as a teenager and, and young adult, did you spend more of your social life on, you know, on the keyboard, like, like a keyboard, like on the internet, we used to call it away from keyboard. Like that's, that was the real life. So the opposite of that. Uh, yeah. When, so I was in that crossover generation where, you know, cell phones had just started coming out. So I got like my first cell phone, you know, at the very end of high school. So, um, Same, I yeah. wasn't, yeah, exactly. So like, I, I actually remember both, both sides of this and, uh, I think that we're unique, or at least our generation is kind of unique in this uh, experience of knowing what it was like before having a computer in your pocket and also knowing what it's like when you have one in your pocket. So I can remember I can remember both worlds and I want to have the best of both. Like I don't want to have to choose <laughs> between you know the really awesome digital communities I'm involved with and then uh, the really awesome real life experiences. I kind of want to enrich both of them using this technology. Do you think that uh, because of us slowly moving into this digital world. And you said something that hit the nail right on the head. We've not been able to bring our full selves into the, on the internet. You, we, we, up until now, up until the NFT generation, up until right now, where we can actually in a decentralized way, start to create identity on the internet, or I don't even like to use that term internet anymore. We need to come up with like a newer Because we have multiple protocols and multiple blockchains and internets that sit on those blockchains. So maybe even that term or whatever, Web3, it's uh, up until now. So that's why I asked, were you a product of that generation that was like, would rather have been on forums than at like the high school football game? Because I was one of that kid. And I thought, and I think that the answer is, is that you and I were just early in in accepting that our social world and our vulnerability could exist on this box called the personal computer. We were one of the first pe- people, but now it's like a very common thing. But if you remember, our parents thought it was weird. If you spent so much time on the internet, your parents were getting you like a therapist. Yeah, yeah they would put a lock on it. Yeah, they would. Put a lock. <laughs> <laughs> they would they, yeah, and, and then now uh, when you talk to parents, especially during the pandemic, they'll actually say, I let my kid play video games with their friends because that's the easiest way for them to be social, right? Because it's it's been very hard for them to interact with it. So it's um, it's come full circle. I think another thing that maybe that cannot be overstated, and it seems just so simple, but allowing people to own digital things, which is what Bitcoin did, uh, gave us property rights online. And I think that it's like it's also very hard to uh, build a build a life online or build an identity online or like bring your full self online unless you can own things as well. And uh, so I think we're still benefiting from that. Just, you know, the simple invention of digital property rights, which Bitcoin enabled uh, over a decade ago, and then just continuing to iterate and improve that. So now we, you know, you don't just have Bitcoin. Now you have tens of thousands of different assets and you have, you know, board apes and crypto punks and all of this other interesting stuff. Um, and those are the things that you're going to want to take with you as you go around online. Like uh, if one of the biggest flexes you can see right now on Twitter is everyone's verifying their very expensive uh, profile pictures. And that yeah. way they can take a part of their um, what they want to associate themselves with online. And I think that's just the beginning. Uh, and it's just so interesting because, you you know, uh, it's amazing to me that you just drop 
property rights into uh, like new markets, as, lo as long as you can establish that, all of a sudden the market just starts taking off and building all sorts of interesting things. And we're just continuing to build out on that cycle. So at Unstoppable Domains, you've basically given people a way to like create a vehicle that is a representation of their identity when it comes to like a, a, a placeholder real estate, if you want to put something there like a web page, or maybe you want to build a metaverse at, at your domain, uh, again, using that term domain, sending payments across, not even payments on a financial sense, but transactions, whether that be playing a game on your phone to like voting, transactions will all go through your uh, your domain at Unstoppable Domains. And it's across multiple blockchains because we know geographically we have languages, we have different values, different people. You're going to have multiple blockchains solely because human efficiency and we all live where we live. So, you know, right now you have the ability for people to send uh, across Ethereum and I can see in a different world how you have, uh, it, it actually just doesn't even ask you what chain that the system will have a recognition mechanism for like detecting what chain you want to transact on. But really, uh, and this is a kind of going in the weeds question a little bit. Technically, how did you, how do you work with Bitcoin? How does it work? Is there a centralization trade-off if I want to start using my unstoppable domain for a Bitcoin? Cause I know other trend, like other blockchains for the listeners know they're all to a complete EVM, but Bitcoin has, doesn't have that because it's more hard money have that smart contract ability yet we're talking about bitcoin companies i'm looking at a project called mint layer that is trying to do that same thing but yeah yeah uh so the way it works is uh it's a, a digital asset so when you have your domain name like uh, matt.crypto or charlie.crypto or .nft or whatever then uh it's an nft inside your wallet so it's just like uh bitcoin if you take the uh digital asset and you put it into your wallet and your personal keys on your phone, then you 100% own it and control it. And then what happened is, is you sign uh, transactions on the blockchain. And because we're on an EVM compatible uh, blockchain, then you can sign a message up there and then you say, this is my BTC address. And you can yeah. have that. Oh, okay. you say, this is my Litecoin. And so those, those get added on. And then it's very extensible. So we support over 250 mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies right now. And uh, we're continuing to add more over time. And then also you can add other different uh, record types up there as well. So it's a pretty um, straightforward system in terms of how it works. And then for security, it's as secure as the network, uh, the blockchain network that uh, it's being recorded on. So for instance, um, we work across three different blockchains right now. Ethereum is one of them. So you can sign those transactions on the Ethereum L1 network. And I think right now the cost to attack that is several billion dollars. So as long as you're you know, sending and receiving transactions for you know, several thousand dollars or several million dollars, the security guarantees of Ethereum are such that you're going to feel pretty confident about that uh, payment. Yeah. So there's there's no trusted there's no trusted third party here once you have the 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 NFT domain minted and in your wallet. Um, and then it's just the things that Unstoppable builds is all the tooling to make it easier because it's you know not everyone knows how to sign a crypto payment or everything. And we're actually doing um, something that I think is very interesting this month is Blockchain.com. Uh, they're they're very large wallet. They were actually one of the first wallets I had for Bitcoin way back Same. in the day. Yeah, actually. Yeah. And we're integrating with them such that when you get an account, you'll get a uh, free uh, dot blockchain domain, and that will be auto attached to all your cryptocurrency uh, addresses. So that way, just when you get a wallet, the first thing that you'll get will just be a way to make it easier to receive cryptocurrency to that wallet address by default. Um, and we think that's very interesting because that could mean that your NFT domain is the first NFT that anybody uh, who gets a blockchain.com wallet <laughs> will ever get. And we're actually already working. We have 20 other wallet partners, actually more than that, signed I up to this. also do this. Yeah. And so I'm on the board the of a few wallets. We're going to, I want to integrate this. <laughs> we're going to do it. And and the thing is, is like, if we're going to have 3 billion plus people sending crypto back and forth, they're not going to want to remember 50 different hex addresses. In fact, yeah. they just can't. And all of these people are going to need names. So we think it's a very uh, intuitive thing. And like, it just makes sense. Like if we're going to have adoption of cryptocurrency, then you're also going to need to have adoption of NFT domain systems. Um, and this is what this is why we've been building this for the past four years. And it's really, last year, it really kind of accelerated. I think we've registered over 2 million of these now. Um, and this is, you know, four years ago when we were talking about NFT domains, 
people didn't even know what we were talking about. They thought we were crazy, but here we are four years later and it's like, wow, this is actually useful. So we're happy to see people use it for payments. And we're also happy to see them use it for these emerging use cases around login or SSO and identity. So I, I go to unstoppabledomains.com and I create one. I create, like, let's just say it's great, charlie.wallet or whatever it is. Do I now have accounts at 200 different blockchains? Can anyone transact? Can someone on like Solana now send me, you know, if they're using one of your integrated wallets, can they then send me, even if I don't have an address on Solana set up yet? Uh, you would need to configure, you would need to have an address on Solana. Okay. Yeah, right. So yeah, you have to get it, you have to get it set up, but it's one time. Once you have it set up, then you can receive it. Uh, and then, like I said, with the wallets, we're actually trying to make it so it's set up by default for users. So right now, you know, it's very early. So people who are coming here and, and getting them for themselves. They're ahead of the curve. Uh, and then when, as we integrate with more and more wallets, it'll actually just be a default part of that process. And yeah, so if you have Solana, it should be, they could send Solana to Charlie dot uh, crypto or, or dot so X or cool. dot MT. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, so you get cool. it. I need to register this like an untold stories dot crypto because it's not for transactions but what you've built is almost like a hyper decentralized because it focuses on read only messaging transaction layer on top of every blockchain you've created a way for people to message but transact across all different blockchains because they've configured that like omnibus type of thing beforehand that's kind of how i look at it it's very brilliant I think that's, uh, and you actually hit on something there, messaging, which is pretty interesting because um, people are starting to build applications. They're building apps, like uh, you know, kind of like a miniature app store for NFT domains. And one of the apps that we have is actually for email. <laughs> and uh, I'm actually chatting with that gentleman later today. And he has it so you can send email uh, from your NFT domain to another NFT domain. Um, and this is just the beginning, like, uh, people want to build full messaging protocols on these things. So if this ends up and these protocol, these, uh, are going to have, because it's an open system, you can have a lot of different developers building different types of apps to work yeah. with NFT domains over the next several years. So I think that the amount of creativity here is going to be, uh, some, there's going to be a lot of things we can't quite think that people are going to do yet, but I think it's going to be you know, tied back to your digital identity and just increasing that utility over time. If we look to the future where like. Crypto companies are not crypto companies, but but public companies are represented as DAOs on top of blockchains. Your on your domain, your dot NFT, your your NFT domain becomes your stake in that you're in that company. Because remember, we talked in the first sentences of the show, the dumb token model is gone. That ERC20 standard, these token, these, these tokens, what we learned is that tokens could be a value a battery for value. It's like the extension of Bitcoin. That's what 2017 kind of taught us. But now unpacking that, these like tokens that we're willing to like hold on to need to be smarter. And they need to be like pan blockchain. Is that like the term pan? Yeah, they'd be like- I think inter- that's good. <laughs> yeah, they need to just, <laughs> blockchains need to be like where they focus on what they're amazing at. And then the complementary applications on top of that can be left to companies like yourself, to projects like yourself, to protocols like yourself. I was going to say wormhole finance, but we saw what happened to them last week. So I don't want to use them as an example. But (laughs) but that concept of like, I do agree with Vitalik. I was talking to someone about this, but like bridges and things like that are going to be very, very tough going forward. Um, This is really cool. And what we're seeing in the blockchain... in crypto space more broadly is that there's starting to be specialization around different parts of the stack. So like you're mentioning, there's like bridge companies and then there's going to be blockchains that are really good at consensus layer and then there's the compute layer and then there's the data storage layer. So I think the industry is just maturing because it's finally gotten big enough where different people are attacking these different pieces of the infrastructure. Um, and I think that that's going to make it get better faster. And then you mentioned DAOs. And I wanted to touch on that. One of the biggest problems with DAOs, so let's imagine a future where majority of companies are on chain, you know, and on chain DAOs or, or something like that, um, is if you're going to have voting where you're going to have people participating, you really want to make sure that that DAO doesn't get uh, tricked or exploited, right? And that happens all the time. And so if you actually have an NFT domain as a way of, you know, signing in transactions and verifying that it's you, that's also another layer of reputation and identity 
um, that will be native to the crypto ecosystem that you can bring to that party to make it easier for DAOs to make good decisions. And like, why would you want to do that? Well, let's say you have a multi-sig on a DAO that controls $150 million or something. Um, and you may want to make sure that it's actually seven unique people. And it's not like one person to be seven different, pretending oh, to good. be seven Yeah, you're people. right, Sybil. We're preventing yeah, against Sybil attacks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, presenting the Sybil attacks on DAOs. And I think that you're going to want to bring some sort of native form of uh, crypto or blockchain ID. And this is one of those ways that you could build that reputation up uh, tied back to an NFT domain. So I, there's all sorts of applications for reputation um, and NFT domains in for for crypto products and i think that we're going to see that happen over the next several years what uh blockchains do you see i i i uh i saw a post that you had saved a uh, hundred million dollars in gas fees on top of uh polygon so i'm assuming polygon ethereum but what uh where do you see the most activity what, what blockchains so uh i spend the majority of my time on evm compatible blockchains now i will point out that uh stacks is doing some interesting things over on yeah Bitcoin. they're doing amazing things yeah, so I, I mean, I, I follow them on Twitter as well. So, and um, the, but I would say that the fastest pace of innovation is probably on the new AVM chains. Uh, and then some of the also uh, cross blockchain uh, platforms uh, like Cosmos and Polkadot are also doing very innovative things. Now, this is the cutting edge stuff. So uh, it's not ready for prime time yet, but that's where I'm seeing most of it. And then in terms of uh, focus on scaling and like really making things like saving people money on gas is basically because if blockchains are too expensive, no one's going to use them. Um, And the technology around that is all around these rollups. And uh, I I think zero knowledge rollups are very interesting. Uh, And we'll see how those kind of evolve in the next two, three years, because that's still I think that technology still needs another one to two years before. Uh, we can see if it's easy enough for people to use. It definitely works technically because uh, there's a couple of projects like Immutable X and a few others that already use it. Um, so, but that, yeah, that's where I see it. I, uh, everything you're having to do with zero knowledge proofs, I think is just like magic to be perfectly honest. So uh, it's like cryptography from the 1990s that found an application in crypto and blockchain uh, in the 2020s. And uh, it's pretty exciting to see what they're doing. And for those who don't know, just real simply, uh, zero knowledge proofs allow you to pack a lot more like condense information down. So, uh, because, uh, instead of, if you had like a hundred things you need to record on the blockchain, instead of recording a hundred of them, you, you could just record a proof of those hundred things happening. So it saves a lot of space. And that's where those things are coming into place, uh, today in crypto. Rollups, uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, kind of like creating side chains on top of secure chains yes. where, there and this is where like the the at the end of the day recognizing that there it's a scale decentralization is a scale and there are trade offs we see like uh we see certain blockchains that almost need to innovate wherever they decide that they are going to be you know bitcoin can be the most hyper decentralized but then you can have ones at the other end of the spectrum but at the end of the day there's different utility for that you may want a blockchain that is so secure, there's one block every four years, maybe right. on voting day, and that's the voting <laughs> blockchain. But then you have blockchains like Ethereum that have blocks every second. We thought that was going to be fast enough, but we were proven wrong. So now you need, but we're realizing not all blocks are equal and not all blocks need to be decentralized. You should be able to choose. And we saw that with like early days of Bitcoin payment fees when you want your transaction to actually process so that there are projects that are like creating like side chains that 8,000 of their blocks are one Bitcoin block. So if yep. you want the decentralization, you just wait 8,000 and one blocks and yep. it's still proof of work. So there's definitely that. And, but bring it all back to unstoppable domains. Not only will I, will, do I believe that the users, it'll be like an autofill where whatever blockchain you're transacting on, it'll be recognized already. But users will get to decide. And to some extent, they will know the difference between like, there'll be only like five or six major ones, but they'll know the differences between them. We'll understand the trade-offs and the products and services around that will enable us to like, kind of like do different things. The same way you get on and off highways, you choose, do you want to go on local roads? Do you want to go on the major freeways? You pay a toll to go in the toll booth lane to go even faster. There's nothing new under the sun. Do you agree or do you disagree? You could disagree. Uh, no, I, I broadly agree. And one of the, as a technologist, the way that I look at it, and just my perspective, is how much security do you want to pay for at a given moment in time? 
So, yeah. you know, there's the, there's the decentralized versus centralized spectrum, which is important, but there's then there's also the security spectrum and uh, what, what's happening with these side chains and these uh, other places where there's more capacity for sending transactions is you, you're trading off security, but you, you have to think about it. If you're sending around, uh, you know, pictures of cats or something for a game, then, you know, each of those things is only worth five or 10 or $20, then you don't need to be paying uh, security fees like on the Bitcoin main chain where they're, you know, securing trillions of dollars of value. And that's more like a settlement network. So uh, I think that you'll, you're right. People will know the difference between these different networks and they will choose the network that makes the most sense for um, what they're transacting on. And that's just how security works. Security is always a trade-off between uh, cost and how secure you want it to be. Um, and that's how it's always been. So yeah, broadly, I feel the same way that you do. Someone pitched me a blockchain that basically like creates 50, has a memory pool that creates like 52 blocks at, at, at the same time. And your transaction gets put into one at random. And then the blockchain only selects one at random. So it's like your chance, it's very low. But the idea was like, because most of these transactions are kind of bullshit anyways, that if you really wanted, you can almost game that blockchain and spend and, and propagate your transactions more because you can almost predict the chance of your transaction getting into a, a block the same way you can kind of predict poker and blackjack and things like that. If you had a fully transparent deck. Yeah, well, I would say that there's a lot of innovation on how to make blockchains go faster. And it's just like the 90s where every 24 months I had to update my modem because I had like 14 kilobits, then 28 and then 56, then, then 100. And then now I've got like a hundred megabits up down or whatever. Uh, and I think we're the same thing in the blockchain space and people will do all sorts of ideas in order to try to make that throughput go higher. And I welcome all of them because everyone on the planet is going to be using uh, crypto and blockchain tech and whatever we can do to get more people on the system is totally worth it. That's actually a great, you brought up, you brought up a great analogy. Um, I remember that too. And then so what happened was like 56K became like good enough for a while. We plateaued, but then we had like DSL, ADSL, and then just like cable, it was faster. From a technology standpoint, what is that? Is there a law about that? Like how technology will like grow, plateau, and then just like hyper accelerate? Well, we don't have one for uh, crypto yet, right? There's Moore's law for, for chips. Uh, and then there's a few other ones for bandwidth, but there should be one for blockchain transactions. Someone should do the math and figure out like how many blockchain transactions are happening every year. And I'm going to bet it's also kind of an exponential curve um, as, because that just seems to be how technology works. As we start improving things, it gets better with more scale. Uh, so there's not one yet, uh, Charlie, but we could probably make one up. <laughs> maybe someone maybe someone listening here will go and do the math and then they will come up with uh, you know the, the law for the speed increase for number of blockchain transactions every year. We can't create them though because it's so new. We we don't need, we barely have one decade of price action, and half of it was like on like basically like the exchanges were built on public Google spreadsheets, the early Bitcoin exchanges. You know, I, a bit instant mine was I tell you the technology was not very advanced. We were building the plumbing from scratch. We were building a whole new financial system on like PVC pipes and duct tape. Yeah, uh, so no. it's like we're so early. We haven't even hit like spring training yet. Um, what are some people doing with their domain names that kind of excite you? What's what app? I'm gonna go over the applications page. I want to see what people are doing. What's some of the most fun type of things that yeah. you could be doing. So I'll call, I'll call out a couple, a couple that I think are interesting. So notifications, I think are very interesting because people who use a lot of apps want to be notified when something happens. Like maybe there's an airdrop for your app or something, and there's really no way to get a notification. So there's a, there's a place called like the uh, Ethereum push notification service, EPNS. And I think that they're one of the apps on that page. Uh, and then another one that's interesting is messaging. I mentioned it earlier, um, mail, just being able to get email to your address. I think that once you have messaging added, I mean, just think about it right now. When someone sends you a Bitcoin transaction, the first thing I do is I like text you. I'm like, hey, did you get it <laughs> right after? And like, so I have to like go from like my Bitcoin wallet to like my messaging app. And I think that those things are going to get you know, connected. And if you look out there, there's all these like super apps these days where it's like everything in one little application. And I think crypto is is going to be the end state for financial super apps. And so you're going to want to be able to do um, that talking and that communicating um, as well. So I think that that's pretty interesting on there. Uh, you know, people are 
launching some basic uh, website like profile pages for their uh, that I think is pretty cool. And that's just kind of like GeoCities was in the 90s, where it's like yeah. just presence online. And then they're actually connecting back different social networks. They're connecting Reddit or Twitter or a couple of these other places so that if someone wants to send you know, some crypto to Charlie, uh, then they can actually go see what your Twitter profile is and what your Reddit. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and then the, the, the other one that I think is neat is connecting avatars. So a lot of people are taking their uh, board ape or their... Uh, Pudgy Ping, one of their CryptoPunk or any of these other NFTs that exist. And they're verifying with that their, with their domain so that uh, when they log into places using the SSO with their domain name, or when they um, or when some people send them payments, we're hoping that uh, the wallets will work so that they can actually pull that picture so that when someone wants to you know, look you up or send you money or whatever, they can also see the um, NFT picture that you bought that, that you want. It's kind of like a phone case. Yeah. Right? So that's yeah. the other one that's coming in. That's so cool. Um... Do you think we're going to have a different term for the word browser in Web3? Are we, is the browser going to go away? I think that uh, the browsers are in a really good position to take advantage of Web3, right? And it's actually surprising to me that Google, Mozilla, Firefox don't have a crypto wallet yet. Like it seems kind like of like an in, oversight. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I guess I'll say that if browsers launch crypto wallets, I think they'll still be here. But if browsers don't launch crypto wallets, I think they're going to have a lot more competitors uh, for, for web browsing. So we'll see. Uh, they're in a really good position because it's hard to build a good browser. It takes a lot of work. Um, but they are being very slow when it comes to crypto adoption. The browser is actually like, because the internet, especially like the TCIP that we pretty much is, is how the internet is run today, it's an unencrypted messaging layer. So the, Browsers do all of the hard work. They package everything up. They put it all together. In fact, some of the first Bitcoin wallets, you remember like InstaWallet, would generate your keys by you moving your mouse around in the browser because your browser would make random, can, can make randomness where the external, externally you can't. So that's how it was kind of like done. And I guess where my questions are getting here is that Namecoin failed. One of the reasons was because you had to download like a new type of node just and running that full time. And again, it was an experiment. Uh, I think like, like downloadable software was very prevalent back in 2009. And we weren't doing like web apps and doing things in your browser wasn't even like conceptualized. Remember how shitty Flash was? You couldn't even use Flash. Everyone's probably laughing who's listening to the show right now. But you guys have actually gotten this natively inside of Brave and Opera already. Chrome, Firefox, and Edge have to be extensions but we're all used to extensions already. So is that like a lesson on timing? Is that a lesson on like business timing right there? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that is a lesson on business timing. And um, I also think it's a bit of tooling too, just to be uh, you know, candid, like it's a lot harder. The older systems like Namecoin for naming, for instance, um, you had to run specialized software, right? And whereas for the newer NFT systems built on existing blockchains, they can just, read off of that there's there's already a bunch of infrastructure right for, for doing those reads and so i think that has also yeah so i think it's huge you're right it's definitely timing and then all these infrastructure providers made it easier for these browsers um and you really have to build those options out to allow these web2 companies to come in here that just to give you an example of this there's a lot of uh apis to read off of blockchains now so that's using like a web2 api like an old technology to read off of these new blockchains um and i think that's been very helpful for getting these web two companies using these products because then they can still check the blockchain to verify the information, but this way the API is much more uh, easier for them to integrate into their products. So yeah, I think you're dead on. It's definitely timing uh, and then industry maturity. You know what you've done with this and what kind of like the whole industry has done largely the, the crypto world is that we've created limitations for the internet. And for the first time since we've we're born out of the internet, you know? We, for the first time, we see its limitations. We see what it can't do. And that's a very scary thing. And I think that's what scares a lot of people and big tech and companies is that they've built all their industries around knowing the bounds of the internet and what people want within them. And like you said, browsers are in great position, financial service companies. 
but especially with the advent of Bitcoin, but really accelerated the past few years is we've like said like, hey, the internet can't do these things. The internet can't do these things. It can't. And now when you've given that person in sub-Saharan Africa the ability to own a piece of the limited internet, you've created like finality. And so it's a, it's a very exciting. And like, this is what, what I get passionate about is like the unknown of the future. Yeah. And uh, I think that the people who are most threatened by this new internet are uh, companies like large companies like Facebook, whose business model is dependent on um, the revenue streams that may be tra- changing, right? They're all dependent on collecting user data and then reselling it. Um, and what happens is now with Bitcoin and with all this crypto technologies evolving is that users can own their digital data. And so you saw uh, Meta, you know, formerly Facebook, their stock price jo- dropped like 20%, you know, the other day. And you know, because the users are leaving and the users, I think, uh, and if we look at where user growth is happening, the user growth is all happening in crypto and in this Web3 space. And they're coming over here and it's because they can now own their digital stuff. Um, and that creates a problem for Facebook because if users can own their digital stuff, they can own their data and, the, and they're the ones who have the private keys to it. And only they can decide whether or not, you know, Facebook or Meta can look at it or whatever that creates huge problems for their ad models. So I think they're like the most threatened business in this space are uh, older businesses who are dependent on business models that just won't work when you have digital property rights out there. Um, and those people are the most threatened. And Facebook is, you know, or Meta, sorry, is pivoting really hard, right? They're spending a lot of money on VR and they're they going to really try to remake pivoting themselves. hard. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to do it. And then the other one everyone points out is governments. But I'll be honest, I think governments are... Uh, I'm pretty optimistic here that governments are going to get comfortable with crypto. Um, and I know that they've had lots of problems in the past and haven't done a great job. Uh, but ultimately, they're going to be able to get comfortable with this because it's going to create just so much more economic uh, value. They're going to make money. You know, Taxes are going to be pouring in from the crypto space. Uh, and I think that they'll be able to come over. So I, I really think the companies that are threatened are the companies dependent on uh, older Web2 uh, business models around ads. And I think you know, the Facebook social network is a really good example of that. Don't they realize that this technology enables us, enables the individual person to make more money and by spending less, like the, the personal life overhead goes down. If you work in this industry, engage with this industry, if you start to do things on top of blockchain rails for your company, for your political organization, for your city, whatever, they're realizing very quickly, you're right. Um, it's very cool. You guys, uh, I was looking, I'm on, I was, uh, looking earlier at your website and, um, did you come out of boost VC? Did you come out of like the thank you data program? Yes, we did. Adam Draper, the guy's a visionary. So (laughs) he, I'm telling you, he understood before his dad, even like, I remember going down to San Mateo, having lunches with Adam back in 2012. And he fundamentally understood how this technology was going to change everything. Uh, and it was really cool. So it's really good to see that he's, that, that they're continuing to, to be investing in this industry and doing a lot of, a lot of crazy things. Like I should have invested in like every company out of, out of Boost VC, but Protocol Labs too. So Protocol Labs is very interesting because they basically are credited with inventing IPFS. Do you think that, can you explain very briefly like IPFS, how that's like the newer, potential TCIP and it's like the cusp of the web three. Yeah. So uh, basically if everyone's going to have ownership over their data online, they're going to need a place to store it. And that seems pretty straightforward. And that's what IPFS and Filecoin and protocol labs, you know, it's an umbrella of companies. They're working on a lot of different projects uh, is working on is that data storage. And it's a really hard problem. And I would actually say that this is the problem that uh, continues to need the most research, even more than consensus uh, yeah. or, or uh, computer, these other layers for crypto systems uh, is data storage. And like, I just can't imagine how much personal data I already have on the internet. But then if we go forward, I'm going to have 50 times more because I'm spending 50% of my day, literally like six, eight hours a day is in front of a screen on the internet. And, but if I look at my assets, less than 1% of my assets are actually uh, digital outside of cryptocurrency. Um, and I think that's going to change because if you're spending 50% of your time online, then I, and now that you have digital property rights, 50% of your assets are going to be online as well. And that's a lot of stuff and you're going to need to, you're going to need to store it somewhere, you know, everything. And so that's what IPFS is working on. 
is a decentralized storage protocol that has very good uptime availability uh, and is you know quick to read. And, and this is important because um, if you're going to be uh, traveling around uh, and uh, you know in the metaverse and you're going to be you know need need to show people different uh, or trade data with people or like let them see you know if you're your doctor's office you know, give them access to your medical records which are just gigantic files uh, you're going to need some place to store that where it can be looked up really quickly as well and so that's what they're on the storage layer and that's the thing that they're working on um, it's kind of like BitTorrent except uh, you know Gen you know the the next generation of that so cool so cool. Matthew Gould, Unstoppable Domains. I'm gonna, I implore everyone to go on your website now, register their personal identity before someone else takes it and start being able to use that to enjoy the Web3 and, and have fun in the metaverse and do a lot of different things. Thanks for taking the time this Friday morning and coming on Untold Stories. Uh, thanks for having me.